time to finally figure out our possibilities with the Meterpeter shell. In the last section, we focused so much on how to gain access in many different ways and we popped a Meterpeter shell so many times. But we never got to see its true power and all of its commands. We only ran a few of them just to make sure the connection was successful. Now, we're going to go real quick through the basic commands that we can do with the Meterpeter shell and then after it, we will see some of the post-exploitation modules and how we can run them. So for this, I already got the shell opened, as we can see right here, Meterpeter session 1 opened, I ran my file, which is shell.exe, and by now all of us should know how to do this. Just send the payload to the target, execute it, and you should have a Meterpeter session on their machine. From here, we can run the help command to see all of the available commands with the Meterpeter shell. If I scroll all the way up and we are going to start from the beginning, the first section of the commands that we get are called core commands. And these commands we are going to brush through real quick. We're just going to mention a few of them that we already know, such as for example this background or bg. If you type background in your Meterpeter shell, this will background your session and you will be able to use your Metasploit framework module. When is this command useful? Well, if I type the command sessions that we already know, we got one session currently. But you might have a session with multiple targets. And in order to navigate between each and every session, you can use the background command to put this Meterpeter session in the background and for example enter a different session with a different machine. So that command is useful in that sense. Of course you don't need to type the background command, you can simply just type instead bg and it will do the same thing. So if I go back to my session and go back to my help command, we can scroll back to the core commands and read some of them and what do they do. So just go to this menu and most of them we are going to cover later on, for now on we are not going to touch them, because most of these are not needed for us at the moment. For example, you know that you can exit the Meterpeter shell with this exit command, background the shell with background command, here we can see how we can switch between different sessions, and you can get the user ID, I believe get UID command is right here, here it is, get UID, get the session UID, so if I type that right here, it will tell me the session UID. We also know the command get user ID, and this will tell us which user are we on the target machine. Okay, so these are just some of the core commands, and of course you can experiment with others, but some of them we're going to cover later on. For now on you can just read through this menu and go to the file system commands. And these file system commands you can just picture them as commands that we use inside of a terminal. So we can change directories, we can print current working directories, list all of the files on the target system, and let's see how that would work. So if I go down here and to see in which directory I am, I can type the command print working directory. It will tell me that I am currently in the slash desktop directory on the target machine. Now why am I here? Well, because the shell.txe inside of that directory, and once the target executed it, our meterpeter session will automatically be inside of the directory where the payload is. Okay? If I wanted to list all of the files inside of here, I can type the dir command, and I can also type the ls command. So it supports both Linux command and Windows command. Dir is used to list files inside of a Windows system. So we can see what files we have right here, and maybe we could find something interesting right here. For example, we get this passwords.txt file. And of course I created this on purpose, just for this tutorial, but this is something that occurs quite often. Matter of fact, years ago, even I had this file where I've written down all of the passwords that I couldn't remember for different websites. And to read the content of this passwords.txt file, we can use a familiar command for us, which is the cat command. So if I type cat passwords.txt, press enter, this will print out all of the content inside of this file. We can see the router, username and password, the Facebook username and password, and the PayPal email and password. So this is something that you could possibly run on, and you want to see the contents, just type the cat command. 
Of course, we don't need to be inside of this directory if we don't want to. We can use our regular cd command to go one directory back, and if we type pwd, we're no longer in the slash desktop directory. Here we can type dir once again to list out all of the files inside of this directory. If we wanted to choose one of these directories, we can go back to them, but for now on, let's just go back to the desktop directory. Great, if I type dir, here are our desktop files, and if we wanted to, we could also download the file from the target machine. So how can we do that? Well, it is as simple as just typing download and then the file name. In this case, let us say we want to download, for example, passwords.txt. I press enter and here it is, it will download it for us. Now I'm not sure where by default the interpreter saves these files, but it could be right here on the desktop and here it is, here is the passwords.txt. And you can also upload files if you want to. For example, let's say we want to upload this red backdoor.txt from one of the previous videos to the target machine. We can see right now we don't have it on the desktop, on the target machine, but if I type upload and then red backdoor.txt, press enter, go back to the desktop just to check out, and here is our file. We successfully uploaded another executable to the target system. Then we could use something like a shell to execute that file. Okay, but we're not going to do that right now. Let us exit out of the shell and run the help command once again just to see what else we can do. Inside of the file system commands, we also get the commands on how we can create and remove files. So we can use rm there to remove a folder, we can use rm to delete the specified file, so for example we want to delete a file on their desktop, we can do that using the regular rm command. We can also create a directory and create files if we want to. So let's see for example if we manage to delete the red backdoor that we just uploaded. We don't want it there, so let us just delete it real quick. Run the rm command and it is no longer here. And let's say we want to create the test directory and we want to copy passwords.txt in the test directory. Hmm, access is denied. Let us just check out right here. We got the test directory, but for some reason we can't seem to copy this file. And this could be due to many different reasons. But the main reason will probably be because we are not an administrator on the target machine. And we're going to check out in some future video how we can become an administrator and system level account just by getting the interpreter shell as a regular user. Remember, if I run the get UID, we're just a regular user. We are not the system level account. But more about that later on, for now on, let us run the help command once again. And you can play with these file system commands that we have right here, but they are just regular commands that we can run inside of a Kalinux terminal just this time you're running it on the target machine. Inside of the networking commands, we only have a few of them, so let's just test two or three of them. For example, this arp command will display the host arp cache. So with this, we should be able to see the IP addresses and their corresponded MAC addresses. These are all of the IP addresses that are inside of our arp tables on the Windows machine. So we have our Linux IP address because we are currently communicating with our target machine from our Kalinux IP address, therefore it must have our Kalinux IP address in the ARP tables. We also get the routers IP address, the broadcast IP address, and all of these down here are not that important. If I run the ifconfig command, of course I will be able to see all of the networking interfaces on the target system, as well as the IP address that the target currently has. If I run the command for example netstat, this will print out all of the connections that our target machine currently has. So we can see right here the connections, the IP addresses, which protocol are they using in case these are using TCP, and down here we have UDP protocol. If I go up here, we should be able to find our shell.txe that established a connection with the Kalinux IP address. So we know that 192.168.1.4 is the IP address of my Windows 10 target machine. 
And here, if I go and find the IP address of Kali Linux machine, and here it is, we can see it is running on port 5555. The connection is established, and the process that is causing this connection is shell.exe or our payload. Great. Now, if you want to, you can go up here and experiment with the other commands as well, but these are not that interesting or important for us at the moment. What is important and what we will cover in the next video are these system commands and user interface commands. We want to see some of the cool stuff such as capturing keystrokes or running a keylogger, running a screenshot on the target desktop, maybe for example recording microphone, recording webcam, all of that we want to check out and see how we can run them. And we will do that in the next video. So experiment with the commands that we covered a little bit. Feel free to run the others as well if you want to check out what do they do. And I will see you in the next lecture.